My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to the destination Spanish mystic and poet, St. John of the Cross wrote a poem about what he called the dark night of the soul. With the events of 2020 and now 2021, it seems that many of us are experiencing a collective dark night of the soul. I remember that as a child, even when things seemed darkest, there was always a sense of light returning, perhaps the result of natural childlike innocence and inner peace. Are there methods and ways that we may return to that state and find joy and peace? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, G.P. Walsh, says that we are born to live a life of peace, health, and prosperity, and that we may achieve this with what he calls inner reconciliation. G.P. Walsh is an inspired teacher whose calling is to bring this wisdom to our world. He's an author, speaker, and master spiritual teacher known as the Irreverent Sage. His website is gpwalsh.com, and he joins us this week to share his path, his experience, and his wisdom. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, G.P. Walsh. Welcome, sir. Hey, Victor. So good to be here. So, so good. And so nice for you to join us and share your wisdom. So please share with us your early path and life and how that led you to experience what you called your night on the bridge. Oh, well, that's the big story. That's, um, I mean, the night on the bridge was the transformation point. Prior to that, it was a very just uh, a deeply, I was a deeply disturbed kid. My mother was mentally ill. Uh, my father couldn't deal with it, so he wasn't around very much. Um, and it, you know, her illness just kind of hung over the house like a cloud. And there was no love, there was no affection, and there was no tenderness. Um, I, I just was always tense and watchful, right? Because you just didn't quite know who was going to show up at any time. So it wasn't a, a peaceful place. And um, as I as I got older, uh, um, once I hit puberty, I went from just trying to be obedient to being a total rebel. And oh, I was just in all sorts of trouble. <laughs> I was basically a juvenile delinquent and um, just defiant and, uh, and, and angry. And if it hadn't been for uh, my, the talent I had for music and the fact that I fell in love with music, I'm pretty sure that would have been my destiny, it would have been uh, jail or worse. But I did, and I just completely absorbed myself in music. So rather than getting into trouble, I was practicing my my instrument over and over and over again. And I found other uh, other guys that were um, uh, also talented. We would write music. We did all sorts of stuff. It was really, really a, a, a great time. But this was rock and roll, right? This was not classical music. So, and, and this is the '60s. So everything that went with rock and roll, all the all the mainly the drugs and i started taking taking drugs because uh, it was the first time i ever felt any kind of relief from the tension at home um i just i, I relaxed and I, I mean, it was just such a strange feeling to be relaxed so needless to say they became a very good companion of mine to the point where it was just constant i was just always stoned on something or other then after a while um it wore off Right, the uh, the positive effect we ha- had, and the the sedating effect wore off, and you have to do more of it. And I just became darker and darker and darker, um, cynical, uh, just just really a horrible person to be around to the point where my friends say, "Get get away! We, nobody wants to be with you." I mean, I was just really just an, just a completely um, uh, unlikable fellow, and this. Continued after I graduated from high school. I, I couldn't hold a job. I couldn't. Uh, I, I I dropped out of. I tried going to a, a junior college. I couldn't stay in the class. I mean, I just really couldn't do anything. I was totally dysfunctional. Didn't have really have a family to speak of. Um, and so I ended up getting a job uh, playing uh, playing drums in a in a bar band in Wisconsin. At that time, the drinking age in Wisconsin for beer was eighteen. So the you know there was just there were hundreds of uh, of uh, of eighteen bars uh, throughout 
Wisconsin. I grew up in Illinois. So with everything I own, I hop in my car and I off I go. About 100 bucks in my pocket. <clears throat> the car breaks down. And by the time I'm done with getting it towed off and everything, I, I'm, I, they let me sleep in it for a couple of days. And so now I arrive with like 15 bucks in my pocket <laughs> and my drum set. I'm sleeping on the floor. Right. It's really the, the, the rock and roll dream. Right. I mean, it was just it was miserable, absolutely miserable. And, you know, we'd rehearse, we'd play and we and we get high. That was that was my life. And I hated it. I just didn't know what I didn't know. I did not have any way out. Well, <clears throat> on one particular evening, sitting around as usual, uh, uh, getting wasted, uh, my whole body just suddenly froze up. I was uh, paralyzed. I was just completely overcome with this terror, and my body wouldn't move. I was just sitting there. The only thing I could move was my eyes. Everything was just distorted and weird, and it felt like I was in a uh, in a in a science fiction movie. It, it, it just I can't describe. My heart was pounding. My throat had closed up. I could barely breathe. My my head felt like it was going to just explode. I couldn't move anything. I couldn't feel my body. And I was thinking to myself, this is it. It's over. And and I was welcoming it. It would be such a huge relief to just die. Well, as I'm sitting there in this in the state, all of a sudden, completely without any input uh, on my part, my body gets up, walks out the door, and starts to walk. Now I have no control over it. I'm out of, and I'm I'm an autopilot. I don't know what's what it's doing. I can't do anything with it. I, I'm I'm just along for the ride. It's turning down this street and that and going about 30 or 40 minutes. It's walking in front. Suddenly it stops, turns right, and I find myself standing on this bridge looking down into this horrendously polluted river. Now, I, <laughs> again, I don't know how I got there. I don't know what this is about. Now, it wasn't a, um, it wasn't like, you know, a, a jump off and end bridge. It was a walking bridge, right? So it was like maybe eight feet off the, off the water. Looking down at this river... I was just suddenly overwhelmed with all this rage and anger and pain, and it just started flying out of me. It was just venomous. I was just railing against everything. This river had been so uh, beautiful at one point. It was one of the cleanest rivers in the country, and now it's like almost dead. And I was just ranting about how horrible human beings were and how the, you know, we destroy every thing, the, the greed and the brutality and the stupidity and... And we, we take everything beautiful and pure and we, and we corrupt it, we destroy it, we, we ruin it. And I thought to myself, I did exactly the same thing to me. I was just, I was this pristine little kid and I completely destroyed myself. And I don't deserve to live. I really don't deserve to live. And I felt it in my bones. Well, in the middle of this rant, I hear this voice. And the voice says, look closer. Now, the voice was so loud and so had carried so much authority that I actually had no choice. I, I had to listen to it. I, I, made, I just stopped me in my tracks, and I sat there looking at the river going, and I said, look at what? And it said, look closer. Look really close. So I just put all of my attention into this, this ugly, polluted river, and I suddenly found myself, it was like Alice in Wonderland, I started to shrink. Everything, I, everything around me started getting really huge. And the next thing I knew, I was suspended in space in the river, and all around me were the molecules of, the, of this polluted river. And the voice said to me, now look at the water. And I looked at the water, and it was clearly the water, this beautiful little H2O. And it said, now look at the pollution. And there was just, you know, this distortion and all this kind of, you know, grotesque stuff. The boy said, they're not touching, are they? And I was stunned. I said, no, they're not. He said, they haven't bonded, have they? I said, no. I was, I was just completely mesmerized. He said, and then the boy said, and if you could find some way to separate them, you'd have the exact same original pristine water that was there from the beginning, wouldn't you? And I was just utterly in shock. I said, yes, it would be the same pure water. And then the voice said, Greg, that's you. <sighs> Sorry. 
No, I understand completely. So this is the concept of original innocence. Yes, that's where it came from. And expound on that a little for us. Well, it was, you know, at that moment, I mean, it's like everything just fell away. It was like I was, I was being reborn. It was just like this incredible light going through me. There was this just total relief. The next thing I know, I'm standing on the bridge. My body is completely, is completely well. Everything's back to normal. I'm stunned. And for the first time that I could remember in my life, I actually felt loved. And I later called that, uh, by night on the bridge, I called that experience of, of original innocence. That is, the water had never become one with the pollution. It was still the water. The key was separating the two. So you could see what was the pollution and what was the water. At our normal level of perception, it all seems to be mixed together. So we, we get the idea that somehow... I, I'm broken and I need to be fixed, that there's all these problems that I have and I've got to solve all these problems. And when I do, then I'll be okay. But what was shown to me that night is you're already okay and that this layer of problems and difficulties and the feeling of being broken is artificial. It doesn't really belong to you. It's just part of the conditioned pattern. Pattern. Now, that understanding of conditioning and how we identify with our conditioning and that sort of thing didn't come to me right away. That feeling of the original innocence never left me. But it took quite a while for me to understand the whole process. I mean, this was 1971. There was no self-help, right? Of course, the miracles hadn't been written. It'd be five years before that would happen. Ten years before there was really a self-help movement or consciousness movement or anything like that. So I was just kind of I was just kind of trying to figure it all out. And little by little over the, over the decades, I, I began to see how this whole thing worked. And that in the essence of every single one of us, there is this pure, innocent essence. Did and you it, ever connect with the source of the voice? Who was that? What was that? Um, <laughs> I, I, I speculated for a while, but, um, it was, it's, it's the voice that speaks to all of us. You can call it God, you can call it the I am, you can call it the truth, you can call it Shiva being, you can call it um, Buddha nature. It, it, it is the voice of the innocence. It is the original you, that which has never been touched. Mm. You know, we have all sorts of different names for it. Um, and the most popular one in our culture, of course, is God. But it is simply the voice of truth. It's that which reveals to you who you really, really are. And that, that was the whole deal. It was, a, it was a mistaken identity. I wasn't all of those things. I had been conditioned to be that way, and based on my particular upbringing, it took the form that it took for me with the rebellion and the drugs and all that kind of stuff. Um, it takes a different form for everybody, but we all experience it. And at, in, at a point in childhood, we all lose that original sense of, of, of innocence and we begin to identify with our conditioning. We have to. It's just part of the process. You know, you're a little kid, you're just doing your little kid stuff, it's all innocent, it's pure, and all of a sudden it runs into the displeasure of, the, of your caregivers, the tribe, the culture, the religion. You're not supposed to be like that, you shouldn't think like that, you shouldn't do like that, you shouldn't feel that, like, that way. And so we end up having to cut off our own n n nature, our own innocence, in order to conform to what the environment wants. And this happens at such an early age, you know, before we can even, before we can speak, let alone think or discriminate, we end up uh, creating a sense of identity based on this very limited version of ourselves. And so we begin to think that's who I actually am. And it's not. You're not your conditioning. And that was the big realization. I saw the innocence, but it took me decades to get uh, really understand how this sense of self, this mistaken sense of self gets created and, and why it happens so pervasively and to everyone. That was what up as in a reconciliation. Where did your spiritual inquiries take you and who were some of the teachers and teachings that inspired your path? Well, in the beginning, you know, I, I, I was a kid who grew up in, in a small town in Illinois, right, uh, outside of Chicago. 
so there, you know, I hadn't, I'd never heard of the word, the word yoga, right? This was long before any of that stuff had happened. Um, there was nothing, there was really no uh, tradition other than Christianity. That's the only, that's the only thing I had known. So I dove into it. I knew it was a spiritual experience. And I knew that the Bible contained spiritual experiences, so I just dived into it to see what it was. And I was fortunate enough to have access to all sorts of great research books, uh, you know, concordances and um, uh, Greek and Hebrew dictionary, various translations of the Bible. I even had access to a, the, uh, the Interpreter's Bible, which is like this 47-volume thing with all sorts of stuff. And so I just poured, poured over it. And I began to I began to see that what took shape as particular uh, stories and particular characters in the Bible, what actually drove them is the experience they had, which was almost identical to my own. And it, it all started to be able to start coming together. And I was, a, I was exposed to the New Thought churches, um, which were around at that time. Um, and then after that, it, it uh, I started... I kind of exhausted that. I took that as far as I could take it. I even I practiced spiritual healing and that sort of stuff, which was really great to to learn that. But I knew there was more. I, I didn't understand it all yet. I, I went through uh, the period of you know psychology with um, uh, Gestalt and at that time you know ab reactions and primal scream and all of that kind of stuff. Um, trying to figure out how how to separate the two. That's what the voice had said. You find a way to separate the two, you'll have the same pure water. So I was learning how to make that separation. And eventually it, it took me into uh, into Advaita Vedanta, which is a, which is a line, a, a spiritual thread that runs through uh, India and Hinduism and Zen Buddhism. And, and that's where it all came together in the inner reconciliation. Prior to that, I had been, I had been taught the spiritual tradition of transcending your body, which I thought meant somehow you, you, you get rid of it, right? You, you, you know, you, you leave your body and all that kind of, and all that kind of stuff. Um, it was much, much later when I read the story of Buddha, who believed the same thing, and that was his practice of austerity for six years until he realized it didn't work. <laughs> I, I just wish I'd known that earlier. Um, and then I, and then I, uh, so I said, well, what does then? And a, a very different, uh, approach to spirituality and healing kind of came over me and it really just kind of popped out of, popped out of nowhere. I was, <laughs> it, it's kind of funny. I was sitting there really frustrated about something that wasn't working and I just couldn't make it. No matter what I did, I couldn't make it work. It just kept failing. Um, and I didn't know why. I just suspected there was still something inside me that was holding on to, to, to something. And I just, I sat there, I closed my eyes um, and, uh, and I put my hands in my lap saying, I, I give up. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, this picture comes into my mind. And I'm sitting at a, at a big conference table. And all around me are secret servicemen. You know, they got the sunglasses, they got the radio in their ear, right? You know, the, the, you know, the, the very... The ugly white uh, black suits they all wear um, that don't fit well. Um, and I'm sitting in, and I'm, now I'm in a room full of these guys, right? And one of them is standing right next to me, looks just like Smith from the movie Matrix, right? Mm. And, I, and his face is like right, he's like right in my face. And, and I go, and I go, what, what, who are you? <laughs> and there's no real answer, just this stern look. I said, well, what are you here? Why are you here? He said, we're here to protect you. P protect me? From what? From everything. Well, what's, wh what am I in danger of? You're in danger of everything. I said, you know, well, what about me? He says, you're the worst. We've got to protect <laughs> you. <laughs> we can't let you do anything. And I sat there, and I, and I, you know, because of all the stuff I learned, I learned some uh, stuff about mythology, you know, Joseph Campbell and that sort of stuff. And I realized I was having a conversation with a very essential energy in my system. I was talking basically to the reptilian stem, to the safety mechanism. And I said, I get it. Yeah, you're right. I have messed a lot of things up. I really can't be trusted. So tell you what, it's kind of crowded in here. Would it be possible for you to protect me, but stand outside? And if something goes wrong, you can charge in, save the day. 
He gets this really quizzical look on his face. He goes, yeah, yeah, we can do that, but I will be right outside. <laughs> Boom. It disappeared, and all of a sudden this weight came off my shoulders. It was like, what the hell? And within like a month, all the things I've been trying to do started happening. <laughs> That's when I launched my first uh, my first ra- radio show called Conversations with G, and it, it it just it was just and it was just this eye opener, and that led directly to the kind of inner dialogue I do with inner reconciliation. I realized that I had been fighting these energies in me. I've been fighting the nervous system. I've been fighting the protective mechanism. I've been struggling with these things, and I r- discovered I needed to reconcile with them. Mm-hmm. They were on my side, mm-hmm. but I had been so antagonistic, I had actually put them deeper into a defensive posture, right? And I had to be defended against. Of course I did. If I go in thinking I know what I'm doing and I'm trying to make them do something other than what they were designed to do, yeah, I mean, I'm antagonist towards it, which is, an, uh, unfortunately, that's the nature of most self-help. And we'll talk more about the concept that you came up with, this inner reconciliation after the break. My guest, G.P. Walsh, please tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and your amazing work. Oh, gpwalsh.com, my brand new site. uh, Everything is there now, including uh, my latest ebook called Angels in the Basement, where I talk all of this. Wonderful. We'll be back with more of G.P. after these words on the Old Times Radio Network. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers, pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4pm Pacific Time, 7pm Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. When you're unemployed, it can seem like there's no way out. But with the right tools, suddenly it all just clicks. Develop new skills and find your path to a new career at findsomethingnew.org. A message from the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is G.P. Walsh. So as we were saying in the first segment, all of that experience and more than 40 years of experience led you to your creation of inner reconciliation. What is inner reconciliation? Well, the big discovery was, um, which completely uh, flip-flopped my whole sense of spirituality and, and what it meant to be a spiritual person, was that uh, you don't transcend the body. You go through it. it you, you, it, the kind of trans, spiritual transcendence of enlightenment and waking and that sort of stuff subsumes everything less than it. It, it doesn't eliminate anything. And I began to realize that the conditioning, that the, the nature of the conditioning that had basically I'd identified with and polluted the system, as the voice had shown me 40 years earlier, I, I finally understood that the, all of the various kinds of energies within the human being make life possible. But there's kind of a natural um, yin and yang to them. And if, and if, you, don't t- if you take sides, right? Okay, I, uh, let's say my, in my case, the thing that was keeping me from moving forward was this sense of not being safe that uh, appeared to me 
as this bunch of secret service men just keeping me lo- basically locked in a closet. I could have tried to get rid of that. Oh, I, well, I did try long before I understood this. I did try to I just you know, visualizing freedom and I'm trying to get, you know, making things happen, but nothing was happening because what I was doing was I was denying this incredibly important part of myself. I created an inner conflict where there didn't need to be one. Now, when I recognized that the nature of the nervous system, the nature of our whole body is to survive and it and that's all it cares about at that level, that energy I was talking to wasn't interested in happiness, it wasn't interested in wealth, it wasn't interested in intimacy or fun. It was only interested in safety, period. And as long as it did that, it was doing its job. So I, when I realized that, I, it was like I, I was taking, I was looking at the Tao. This is how it works. I needed to work with the energy as it was, not the way I thought it should be. And I suddenly I got very humbled by, because I used to think I knew a lot, right? I gained a lot of knowledge over the years, so I really thought I had this stuff down. And so I just basically shut up and started listening. And I found that if I didn't confront it, make a conflict out of it, I honored that the energy system, that it would bend itself to, to, to my intention. So instead of trying to get rid of this thing that's getting in my way, I say, it, I know you have to keep me safe, but could you do it a little differently? I also need some freedom. Now, it's very conciliatory. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm trying to force it. I'm not doing self-help stuff on it. I'm not trying to visualize it away. I'm saying, let's work together. Let's reconcile. I have this deep desire to accomplish this, and you absolutely must keep me safe. Can we work together? I didn't take sides. I would just say, you guys work it out. And I called that position the position of the heart or the peacemaker. I became a peacemaker, kind of utilizing all the different energies for what they were. And we have many of them. We have the energy of identity. We have the energy of safety. We have the energy of creativity and freedom. We have the energy of vision. We have the energy of, uh, you know, the creative power of, of, of the voice. Uh, we have our spiritual ambitions. All of these, if you try to favor one over the other, creates the inner conflict which brings the whole thing to a halt. And it's interesting because it, in, the, um, in the Buddhist tradition, the Four Noble Truths is one of the most uh, you know, fundamental of his teachings. And the four, uh, the four Noble Truths of suffering. And the word suffering, as he used it, is a Sanskrit word, uh, dukkha. It gets translated in English suffering. And in dukkha refers to the hub of a wheel that has gotten out of true and can't move. In other words, it's gotten stuck. When we identify with one part of us and not another, which we all have to because we all have to you know, take parts of us that are unappealing to our tribe and bury them out of sight, they become internally, we see them as an enemy. I, I can't let that feeling be there, so I have to disown it. But you can't get rid of it because it's you, right? <laughs> so instead of trying to overcome these things or transcend it, I started to reconcile with them. All of these various kinds of feelings. I didn't take sides. I knew every single one of them was necessary to be a whole human being, to have the full human experience. And just the most marvelous things started happening. <laughs> just this this calmness. And I saw it was the missing piece that, that um, it was really the path of love. I mean, what I was doing was embodying unconditional love. There was no longer any part of me that was unacceptable. Mm. I was living in the heart. And no matter how horrible it may have seemed, right? You know, it's like, you know, nobody, nobody likes to think about their colon, but imagine what you'd be without it, right? <laughs> So, so in essence, this inner conflict is really the root of all suffering. It's the heart and soul of the suffering. Yeah, we yeah. are simply in a war with ourselves, and we, and obviously, you can't win it. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting you shared about dukkha and the the meaning of it, the real meaning of it, where it's where it came from. Uh, I had a wonderful spiritual teacher uh, when I was in seminary in the nineteen nineties. Uh, who taught us about the original version of the Hebrew word for sin, which was the word chet, which literally translated meant an archer missing the target. Yes. Yes. 
it's amazing how when you look at the original meaning that was the original intention, it totally changes your perspective and your yes. approach. There's another great word that I refer to often, um, and that's the word forgiveness, mm. being forgiven. And our, our definition of it as it's come down to us through history means pardoned, right? I did something bad. I deserve to be punished, but I'm being let off the hook. I'm being punished. I'm being pardoned. The actual meaning of that word, uh, as Christ used it, meant to be vindicated, mm. to be found not guilty. Mm. Original innocence. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. Beautiful. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's just that discovery that Christ saw so clearly. It's just he saw God in every way, saw that original purity, that, that beauty. Absolutely. And another wonderful thing that you brought to us and that you bring to us and that you remind us of is that that essence, that original voice that spoke to you, that's within each and every one of us. Yes. <laughs> yes. We just have to learn to listen. And it's always talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but oftentimes you can't hear it because of your own chatter, right? Just be quiet and listen for a little bit. You'd be amazed. Absolutely. Yeah. There's this just this this vital, essential, primordial energy. We can call it God, you know, whatever you want to call it, but it is at the heart of everyone. It is the beingness of all of us. Hmm. Absolutely. I remember a line from uh, Moody Blues, Justin Hayward's song, The Voice, and it says, understand the voice within and feel the change already beginning. What a wonderful concept. Yes. It really yeah. is. You say that many seekers have been on the self-help treadmill and need to get off. How can they do that? <laughs> um, well, you know, we, we like to think that... Um, we love to use the, the analogy of the onion. You're going to peel back all the layer, layers and then you're going to get to the center. But why is it that we keep peeling layers and we just get more layers? I, I see the whole, the whole problem is like uh, the problems are like shark's teeth. You know, the shark has three teeth at any given time. There's one he's using. There's one like halfway down the mouth and another one's just come out of the gum. Breaks off a tooth. Voomp, another one takes its place and he grows a third again. You never run out. If you're trying to fix problems, your mind will constantly be creating problems. You're a fixer. You, you, you'll be a seeker. You can't be a finder and a seeker at the same time. And, and the mistake is that somehow I, I've got, I got this idea as to what my life is supposed to be like, how I'm supposed to feel, what I'm supposed to look like. And nobody ever asks the body, never asks the energy itself. And as a result, we're trying to force, uh, you're trying to basically, you're standing on, in, the, in the ocean trying to push the waves back out to sea. All you're going to get is pummeled. You're fighting against your nature because you, you haven't accepted it and you want it to be something else. And we, we, get, we get very, very sophisticated techniques for trying to do that. And there are people who, who, who claim to have these big successes and this is how I did it. So you study their program and you do it, but it doesn't really work for you. It, it is a treadmill, right? But it's, there's just always going to be another problem because the underlying assumption is there's something wrong with me that needs to be fixed. But what I saw all those years ago, no, there's nothing wrong with you at all. You're not broken. Now, what's it like to start? If you started your day from the point of view that there's nothing wrong with me, I'm not broken, I am simply, I am simply bringing my life into harmony with my natural, my natural being. What's that life like as opposed to, oh, God, I've got to fix this. I'm just not good enough. I've got to meditate more. I've got I've to visualize more. I've got to put up a new uh, vision, vision board. Which one sounds more natural? Which one sounds uh, would, that would actually lead to the life you desire? Often, well-meaning friends, family members, counselors, teachers might offer the admonition, just let it go. Why doesn't that work? <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, usually it's even spoken like, oh, come on, let it go, will you? <laughs> yeah, <really? laughs> Get it. yeah, usually it doesn't have a lot of kindness behind it when they say things like that. Be, because what, Because we... We, don't, we wouldn't know what to do without it. Without some in, inkling of who you are and what you really are, 
right? You don't know how to let go, right? How do I let go of something? How do I let go of my anger towards somebody? Right? You can, what, what usually happens is what we do is we, okay, I shouldn't be angry. I'm a spiritual person now. Uh, I'm not going to feel that anger. And it's the under there seething, but all you've done is effectively suppressed it or distract yourself from it. Uh, suppressed it, sorry. And so what, how do you really, really let it go? Well, the, you have to go through it. You have to let yourself feel it. So if you actually give yourself permission to feel the anger, and I do this when I work with people, and I use EFT as part of the process to do that. I just vent. Vent the hell out of it. Vent and vent and vent and vent. And what will happen is when you give the energy permission to feel what it's feeling in the moment, you step out of conflict. Now I'm not trying to get rid of the anger. I'm reconciling with it. And what happens is because I'm not fighting, the nervous system detects that it doesn't have to defend itself, and the defenses start to come down. And when the defenses start to come down, it looks itself. The energy is very smart, right? You've got stuff going on, checking the environment constantly. It's aware of way more than we are cognitively. If it senses that the environment is has become safer, it naturally adapts to that environment. The defenses come down. And what happens when the defenses come down? All that energy gets released for creative expression. Mm. It's the same energy. <laughs> what, what does that feel like emotionally and physically? Um, it'll feel like you'll feel lighter. There'll just be this feeling of relief. You might find yourself smiling because all of a sudden the energy knows how to get rid of the how to get rid of it. I mean, to, to release it. And it will release it the moment it doesn't need it. Because remember, it, anger, you know... It, this particular case is uh, it's a natural function it it's when you feel vulnerable you know you're either going to have fear which means i'm going to run away or you're going to have anger which means i'm going to fight those are very natural feelings they just they can get uh, if they get suppressed they just kind of they get kind of sit under there what happens just what happens when you've just been in an argument with somebody and uh you, you resolve and you're now kissing and making up what does that feel like mm. <laughs> That's what it is. You are making up. You've hit a point of this is real self-acceptance. This is genuine, unconditional love. And that brings about a sh an inner shift that is just uh, 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 <laughs> it's impossible to describe. You just feel whole. You feel like yourself again. And, and since incredible. and since each of us have these different or unique energies or aspects, that accounts for the conflict. Yes. Yeah. You, 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 life is, uh, you know, the contrast of energies, right? I mean, without that, what in the heck would you have? Right. You have to, you have to have the conflict. You have to have the contrast. But if I take a position, this is an acceptable feeling. This is not an acceptable feeling. I'm going to favor this feeling, you know, attachment. I'm going to hold on to it, and then I'm going to try to push this other one away. Now, there's nothing inherently in conflict with those two feelings. I've just created it out of thin air. Yeah, <laughs> I made it up. I don't like this one. I like that one. Boom. There's the conflict. Now, if it's a part of you, it doesn't matter how much you dislike it. It's not going to go away. <laughs> so you might as well, you might as well accept it. And we find that, <laughs> that when you do begin to accept it, you realize they're not negative at all. Mm -hmm. They're quite natural. That's why I named that book Angels in the Basement. And well-meaning friends and families, teachers and counselors say, you shouldn't feel that way. Absolutely <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Absolutely wrong. As if you could, you, you already are. I already pointed that out. You yeah. already are feeling it. Yeah. You shouldn't feel that. Too late. <laughs> Absolutely. It's already Absolutely. there. You can, either, you can either fight it or you can accept the feeling and see where it takes you. And it always takes you someplace good and harmonious. Absolutely. Life isn't in, at war with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. My guest is G.P. Walsh. We'll be back with more of him after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. 
Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for that new understanding that will enhance your life and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Look out world, we're getting strong. The future's here and we belong. She can step, she can do more. Like build a rocket and watch it soar. Clean the oceans and make the world a better place. Oh. She can step, so can you. Find a cure. Learn more at She Can STEM, a message brought to you by the Ad Council. Imagine yourself being transported to India, to the banks of the Ganga, and an ashram in Rishikesh. Visualize that you are welcome to satsang with an American sannyasi who shares the wisdom of her guru. Your visualization has manifested. Join Satvi Bhagawati Saraswati for inspiration and transformation every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on OM Times Radio. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. A social distancing tip. Keeping your distance from others is important in slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are some fun things to do alone. Read a book, take a walk, unpack your suitcase from that trip you took last September, paint a self-portrait, catch up on a TV series, do a puzzle. Remember, we should all stay home to lower the risk for everyone. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hi, this is Bill Maher. I can find humor in almost anything, but one thing I never laugh about is cruelty to animals. If you don't get the joke either, write People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, 501 Front Street, Norfolk, Virginia, 23510. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, G.P. Walsh. So we're talking about this process of reconciliation. Do we need to look at our childhood experiences in this process? No. Thank God. (laughs) Um, (laughs) What I found, and this to me was just like such a mind blower, as as I mentioned in the last segment, you know, I, I used to I used to think I was really smart, right? I was armed with all these two, all these things I'd studied, this knowledge, you know, spiritual knowledge and personal development knowledge, development knowledge and psychological knowledge that I knew what was happening. And with that experience with uh, Smith and the Secret Service, everything began to shift and I began to have these conversations in me instead. So I would show up realizing that I didn't know what the hell I was doing and that they did. And I didn't have to figure out some event that took place in my childhood or my past life. You know, I didn't have to analyze it till I could figure it out. They already knew. The energy that was stuck knows exactly why it was stuck. (laughs) All I had to do was ask it. And really what it came down to, all I had to do was create an environment that was safe. Right. It was the absence of safety that created the created those the the problems in the first place. 
because it wasn't safe to be myself. It's an existential crisis. It's not, you know, my, it's not just the environment or the environment, you know, was loving or that. I, I wasn't allowed to be me, which is the experience we all have. We have to bury parts of us to be able to survive in whatever uh, environment we're in. And for some, it's more severe than others. Um, th- this is what happens. I disowned part of, part of myself. So when I started just creating the environment of safety, because it was danger that put it in that position, it was obvious if I create an environment of safety, I will give it the environment it needs to do what it needs to do. And if the environment isn't safe because I'm trying to tell it what to do, it's going to have to hold on to that position. It's going to just, it's going to double down. It's going to dig in. So it all, it became all about how do I make it safe? I became safe. Mm. And I was just safe. Okay, you're here for a reason. If you don't want me to do this, you know, I want to do this and you don't want me to, you obviously have enough power to stop me. (laughs) You've been doing it quite effectively. So what are you trying to protect me from? And I would just be quiet. Mm. And sometimes just being, just doing that, just creating the environment of of safety, boom, it just let go of the, the energy. Done. Didn't need to do anything. Sometimes it would show me where it came from, an originating event in childhood. Um, it, working with myself and you know, doing with, it, with others, events from, that were obviously in other lives came up. Now, I didn't do past life regression. I wasn't trying to get any of that. I'm not trying to dig in and find anything. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay, you show me. And whatever needed to come up would come up. And... And it was just amazing. I would say, you know, if you need to show me, if you need to show me what happened, I'm listening. If you don't, that's fine too. It's up to you. Mm-hmm. I just, I became completely uh, uh, malleable. You tell me what to do. And, of course, that creates such an environment of, of safety and cooperation and reconciliation that the defenses just kept coming down. Mm-hmm. It didn't need to defend itself anymore. And yes, when that happens, the some of the stuck traumatic energy will come to the surface. Oh, you know, it'll be a shudder in the body or something will happen. This memory is, oh my God, oh my God. You'll find yourself, you know, five years old standing in front of the class, you know, humiliated or something. But you're seeing it as the energy is releasing it. Absolutely. Do you teach inner reconciliation? May our listeners study it with you? Yes, indeed. I have... Um, I have three levels of it that's uh, pre-recorded. Um, I think there's probably about 120 hours of video on, on the three different levels. Um, and uh, it really is embodied in everything I do. I am right in the middle now of teaching a coaching course about EFT, you know, the tapping, meridian tapping. Yes. And I have my way of doing it, which is inner reconciliation, because I found that uh, that uh, EFT uh, – actually communicated safety through touch. Mm. That is why it worked. Because using those particular, touching those particular spots of the body when you're doing tapping tells the nervous system through touch you're safe. And remember, touch, you know, our cognitive brain is only three million years old. Uh, The limbic brain, uh, which is the realm of touch and bonding the mammals, is 250 million years old. Mm. So (laughs) getting in touch with that uh, makes absolute sense, and I adopted EFT to that. So, but inner reconciliation is in absolutely everything I do. It is the essence of all of it, no matter what I, the course is called. Um, at the heart of it is this essential uh, insight. That there's nothing wrong with you. We are reconciling with you. We're bringing you back to who you really are. And you, and you discover that there's never been anything wrong with you. And that is the big thing that that freeze it becomes safe to be you and that's also the open door to the deepest spiritual insights you find that that voice that you've called god and yourself are one and the same and it leads to self-love and self-compassion yes it does oh the most beautiful self-love 
Absolutely. Something that we all need. Um, in our introduction, I alluded to the fact that the experiences of last year and, and the beginning of this year uh, can be compared to a collective dark night of the soul. Is the upheaval that our world experiences right now uh, here to awaken us? Of course. Um, you, you know, just anybody who's done any work on themselves in any in any form has has known you've you've come up against you've come up against your own sense of limitation, right? Seeing that, becoming conscious of that, opens up the door to be able to grow, right? And how does that appear, right? It doesn't always appear as a nice, as the nice path. There's rainbows and unicorns, right? <laughs> Oftentimes it's struggles, it's difficulties, it's an illness. And we all personally know that. Having gotten through that, we look back and say, wow, I needed that in order to transform to be who I am. I, it's not really this easy path that we're, we think we're seeking. We were never meant to stay in Eden. We were supposed to get kicked out, <laughs> right? Now, if you take that same, your personal experience and magnify it, look around. We're running out of moves. The old way we've been doing things, our institutions, the structures, our economics, our politics, our religion, they don't work anymore. They do not, they're not holding up. And you can tell because the whole thing's broken, it breaks down when it's facing a real challenge. And so, yes, the, you know, the, these things come not to punish us, as a lot of people say. They come to show us how strong we actually are when we will drop the nonsense, drop the bullshit, right, and, and begin to truly embrace each other in love. Absolutely. Many of us approach life as duality, good and bad, positive and negative. How may letting go of these concepts lead us to spiritual awakening? Well, that's the only spiritual awakening there is. When you see that these concepts are relative, we made them up, right? What's good and evil? Well, good is what I like and evil is what you like. I mean, it really comes down to that. Nobody, there's nobody, you know, sitting, get up in the morning thinking about how how hor what horrible things they can do to somebody else. Your position is always somehow good. When you realize that that's what is at work here, these conflicting stories, you begin to find that there's this place beyond opposites. This is what is referred to as, as, as enlightenment. It's, it's referred to as nirvana, as non-duality. There's a place from which everything else is being viewed, Life in all of its contrast, right? its ups and downs and masculine and feminine and all the different kinds of contrast. Right? But there's a place in you that is watching all of that that is beyond all those. And I know it's beyond because you can see them. <laughs> I can see both sides. Now, again, the, the problem of making good and evil is that I take one side and then I identify with it. Now I hold on to it. Now I'm stuck in that position. The moment I do that, I create the conflict with the other. I just created it. There isn't one, really. I've just made one up because I've identified with this. Now I'm stuck. I'm in dukkha. I am create, experiencing and creating suffering of my own making. Yes, we all have to decide in any given moment what's the best thing to do, what's not the best thing to do, right? Their relative decisions in one moment, what's the perfectly right thing in one moment can be the perfectly wrong thing in the next. But if I'm clinging to a position, I'm going to try to do the same thing over and over and over again, even though it doesn't fit. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a carpenter and I'm showing up with my hammer to give a massage, not a tool. Yeah. And that's what we're experiencing. We have to let go. We have to let go of who we thought we were, of clinging to the various kinds of, of means we used to um, to uh, basically, you know, just create a, a, a society where we didn't kill each other. But we're we're growing into something much deeper. It's a calling. Absolutely. And I, and I know it's happening because I experienced it. I didn't ask for my experience on the bridge. I couldn't have put that on a vision board. It was just given freely. And it was just enough of an opening in me that I that I received it. But it's happening to everyone now. I've not, I've never even read about a period of time where, where the awakening has been touching so many people. It, it's astounding. 
And you've said that consciousness is evolving and that ultimately we will not even recognize ourselves. <laughs> yes. We will look back at this time with, uh, with a kind of a, 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 an affectionate amusing the way we, would, we look back on, um, on the Neanderthal. It is a transformation of that magnitude. It's a completely different definition of human being is emerging, and it's beyond. It is beyond what anybody could ever possibly imagine. And if we come out of this with a world of kindness and compassion, and love, and and also love of self, self compassion, mm. self worth, yeah. I think that the ultimate transformation will be so beautiful and so worth the experience. That is the transformation that's happening, and it, yes, it is worth it. My guest, G.P. Walsh. G.P., please tell our listeners one more time where they can find out about you and this wonderful work and wisdom you bring to the world. Uh, GPWalsh.com. Couldn't get easier. I mean, as small as I possibly could. and It's got all the information, in my classes, uh, meditations, um, also uh, upcoming live stuff that I'll be doing um, uh, and uh, as well as a lot of uh, free stuff there as well. My my new ebook, which is for free, Angels in the Basement. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wisdom. Thank you for having me, Victor. It's great. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>